Right, welcome to our final World Christianity Seminar this term. It's already very summary here in Cambridge for those of you who are here, so it very much feels like the last seminar term, but I'm extremely pleased to have with us today Dr. Jude Bachmann from Heidelberg um, with a paper on Nigerian Christian elites. Um, Dr. Bachmann got her PhD in Heidelberg in 2020 with what I think is an inspiring study of of witchcraft because what she does um, and actually came out as a book and I got my own copy today so uh, what she does um, in the study is actually look at witchcraft discourse as a joint production between missionary discourses Muslims Christians and global esotericism um, and the book has both basically a historical and a contemporary part and shows how you know the, the um, orientalization or the sort of exoticization of witchcraft is, is a problem and we need to rethink this and understand it in, in its global entanglement with European understandings of religion and all of that. And it's those interests that uh, you is pursuing with her postdoc project, which is a lot about um, in traditional Yoruba religion and how this was conceived through Christian elites, but in dialogue with global esotericism and the thesis that she wishes to defend before us today, I think, if I, if I read the abstract right, is actually don't begin the history of sort of enchanted, quote unquote, uh, uh, Christianity with Pentecostalism, but actually begin it much earlier with the dialogue that Nigerian Christian elites had with esotericism, with the European differentiation between religion and science and so on. Um, so I think this should be a very, very stimulating paper, and I look forward to discussing it with you all um, online and here in the room. And first of all, welcome you and we look forward to your paper. Uh, thank you, Jörg, for the lovely introduction. <laughs> so it's through, you know, when Jörg says something about my work, I'm actually realizing, yeah, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you for being present either here or in the, in the Zoom. And I think I'm going to kick this off. Next slide, please. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, Christianity in, Af in Africa is often perceived as a challenge to European thinking, and this was evident in the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, so, these are uh, shot, uh, snapshot, um, screenshots from the BBC, uh, which reported on Nigeria's megachurches, for example, and laid emphasis on the conspiracies which were spread in this Christian spectrum. Uh, TB Joshua, who had prophesied the pandemic to end by 27th of March 2020, featured prominently in the report, and you can see, uh, you can see him on the right side of the slide. Um, this report ended again with a critique of the exaggerated promises of healing in these churches with miracle waters and holy, uh, holy oils, and media gloated when TB Joshua died last year of COVID-19. Um, yeah, in these kind of media publications, there are certain stereotypes reproduced over and over again, especially the wrong expectations of divine supernatural intervention or the magical thinking demonstrated therein are very common aspects in many depictions. As these reports are often targeting educated Europeans or African expats, they produce or support at least self images of being rational in contrast. Next slide, please. Among scholars, the rationality or enchantedness of African Christianity is a hot topic. In his 2015 book, Christianity, Development and Modernity in Africa, Paul Gifford argue, argued that this kind of enchanted Christianity, the kind that believed in witches and other supernatural entities, was a heritage of traditional African religion. He writes, um, in traditional African religion, there is most often a supreme being and lesser deities, ancestors and spirits dwelling in rocks, rivers, trees, animals and various objects. All spirits have powers which can affect humans. The physical realm and the realm of the spirit are not separate from each other. Nothing is purely matter. Gifford contrasts this Christianity with the socially less influential secularized Christianity prevalent especially among Catholics in Africa. The enchanted Christianity pervaded public and political life, even in its most modern aspects, and thus inhibited Africa's journey into modernity. Um, scholars taking an opposite stance towards this kind of Christianity, 
enchanted, supposedly enchanted kind of crescenti, um, have chosen different routes. Next slide, please. Um, in her recent article, Understanding Religion and Politics in Africa, Annika Fast, um, I hope I pronounced this name correctly, has called for the false binaries of rationality versus enchantment, religion versus politics, tradition versus modernity to end and for scholars to reflect on the moral claims that they make when applying certain concepts. Fast writes, um, democracy, development and modernity are not religiously neutral concepts. Therefore, scholars need to interact with the claims of African political religious imagination in ways that more explicitly recognizes their own situated engagement in a moral tradition. Next slide. Birgit Meyer has argued for a slightly different approach. In her recent article, What is Religion in Africa? Maya proposes to trace concepts in Africa um, like religion, um, which were introduced by the missionary and colonial encounter through their effects and counter practices. Maya is specifically interested in material objects and bodily practices, which have become globally entangled either through their introduction into Africa or their extraction from Africa. One of the avenues Maya pursues, in this, uh, Maya pursues is the ways in which missionaries preached otherworldliness and immaterialism, but as producers, traders, and consumers in the modern colonial economy also introduce strong modes of materialism. By looking at these ambivalent practices, we also find reason to question the dichotomies present in missionary writing and all the writing that followed it, also maybe um, Paul Giffords. Next slide. Today, I want to try and follow um, Fast and Maya's suggestions. Um, first of all, looking at Christianity in Africa as globally entangled, considering positions marking an African worldview, rather the effect than the antecedent of, of encounter. Secondly, by looking at um, the global entanglement, we may also understand the ways in which European researchers and with them our European public, think of the media we saw earlier, are positioned. Describing Christianity in Africa is never neutral, but um, this is not to say that every description of implying a conscious positionality. And that is why I understand this talk as a venture into the history of our present condition, which is marked by a very visible enchanted Christianity over there and a rather invisible self-image of supposedly rational Christianity. My thesis is that both of these, um, an enchanted and a rational Christianity, a supposedly African and a supposedly European Christianity, are entangled in one and the same past, connected by multiple significant knots, um, of which I can only show one <laughs> this afternoon. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, I have to be a bit humble there. Um, yeah, so usually if the antecedent of Pentecostal churches in Africa are called for, um, scholars write about the African initiated churches or in Nigeria specifically the Aladura, the praying churches. Uh, that is certainly one of the antecedents, but I want to go back a bit more to what John Peel has discussed as the antecedents of the Aladura churches. Um, Peel writes uh, about a few African churches founded around the turn of the century which to an extent had a similar program to Aladora churches. They wanted to be independent from missionary Christianity, but um, Peel also argues that mostly they was consumed about the question, who was in charge, who was, who was leader? Um, Africans should be in leadership positions. That's, um, that's, the, um, that's the point that he draws out from those African churches. Um, however, these churches were founded and seemingly forgotten. And I um, want to present a slightly different view of that time in the late 19th century. Um, these churches, their founder pastors and members, lead us into vibrant theological discussions. These discussions um, of how a new independent Christianity should look like can be seen as relevant antecedents of today's Christian landscape. This new Christianity was made uh, up by mission educated native elites who participated in global theological discourse at the time. They were very well versed, I think, in new thoughts on Bible exegesis, on religion and science, and on esotericism. They also had a lot to say about what we may call African tradition in this context. Um, I have specifically chosen the um, 
well, slightly extravagant figure of John Augustus Arayunko to dive into this um, rich context. <laughs> So um, you can actually see a picture of his um, on the left-hand side of the slide. Um, so to an extent, John Augustus of Nicole has a very standard early Christian biography. Um, he was born in what came to be known as the Rubaland in 1848. Though not a freed slave like many others at the time, he was educated in Freetown, Sierra Leone, under the auspices of the missionary societies which had made it their cause to educate and civilize the free slaves and their context of origin along the coast and into the interior. And as many of these mission educated uh, natives, he joined a missionary society, in his case, the US American United Brethren Church, which was active uh, in the Sierra Leonean interior. Um, on a trip to the USA, he was ordained into the Methodist church then, and later also founded his own revivalist church the Gospel Banner Mission when he arrived back at Freetown. His travels to, um, his travels to and lectures in the US and then uh, afterwards in Britain gave him the reputation of a sought after intellectually stimulating public speaker back home in West Africa. Uh, and he was often called uh, the professor in this context. Um, uh, in his later life, he worked for the Liberian government, but we want to, um, or I want to specifically focus in this talk um, on uh, this phase of lectureship, which spans the time from the late 1880s um, to the early 1900s. During this time, he gave lectures in West Africa as well. And I specifically want to look at a uh, three-piece lecture series that, um, that was delivered in Lagos in 1900, and another lecture given at the opening of the West African Psychical Institute, uh, Yoruba branch in 1901. Um, which were printed in the Lego Standard, um, uh, the, the headline of the newspapers. Uh, you can see at the knees on the, on the slide, for God, the King and the People. Um, so um, so these, uh, this was a weekly local newspaper, and um, as Klaus Kuschok and others have, have drawn out, newspapers were a natural medium for the early Christian elites in, in West Africa. Um, they either founded and co-edited journals themselves or corresponded vigorously with the editors to have their thoughts on matters printed in these papers. Uh, and we will turn to the matters that were among the ones most enthusiastically debated in a minute. I just want to, uh, yeah, look a bit into the, the uh, contents more generally. Um, so first of all, the audience uh, reported. Um, so the three-piece lecture series in Lagos was um, uh, reportedly well attended by, and I quote here um, from the article that summarizes the lecture, bishops, members of council, clergymen of different denominations, merchants, traders, government officials, professionals, educationists, writing clerks, workmen, and other, and several ladies. <laughs> um, we have to, of course, note that these are essentially the profession of early Christian elites around 1900, um, a few of whom were also explicitly named, for example, the Reverend James Johnson, the politician Herbert Macaulay, the nationalist and lawyer J. Egerton Shingo, the nationalist and auctioneer Adam Moyua Hastrup, a few names, maybe, uh, maybe they ring a bell, maybe they don't. Um, so, the lecture series was concluded by an extra question and answer session. And this uh, con concluding session also allows us a peek into how these lectures were received, which aspects were picked up, um, emphasized, or reframed. Um, Abel Yumi calls lecture at the opening of the West African Psychical Institute, uh, which is shown below, um, is a slightly different case. Um, whereas the three-piece lecture series was not explicitly marked by the presence of other religious groups, as you can see, it was um, supposedly Christian, we don't know, um, Christian audience, but the um, uh, opening lecture, which you can see, uh, that's the last sort of bit, the West African Psychic Institute, uh, this um, lecture was actually explicitly marked by the presence of the Muslim community. Um, specifically the Shita Bay that was addressed, um, addressed in the lecture. Um, 
So uh, it, it's very interesting because uh, the um, the bay uh, actually put the audience, um, which was sort of members of that uh, new psychical institute, um, to a test um, specifically of uh, Ramli and Siri, so Muslim magical practices. And it's reported uh, in the newspaper that uh, he, he put the members to a test and uh, reportedly they passed with flying colors. <laughs> So these magical practices also lead us into what um, Abba Yumi around 1900 liked to lecture about uh, to his country, men and women. And he began the three-piece lecture series with a discussion of what he called um, the ancient sciences of our fathers, referring explicitly to Sigidi, Fange, Kofong, and kindred black arts. Uh, the second lecture focused on Ifa, uh, the Yoruba definition practice, um, and the third on secret societies. Uh, the opening lecture that I mentioned uh, before um, uh, of the Psychical Institute discussed more broadly African science and religion. And two observations um, before we dive into the themes of the new Christianity that I want to draw out from these um, lectures um, is first, um, there are a lot of references to the Bible, either single verses figures or stories um, that feature very prominently in these lectures. Um, and maybe, well, later we'll, we'll pick this specific point up again. Um, and secondly, it is all presented under the umbrella discussion of independence and freedom. Um, so, uh, and I quote here, we have our own line of development. Uh, I you call this quoted in the first lecture and calling back memories of slavery in the second lecture, and that is the bit that you can read on the slide on the left-hand side, um, just the last sentence, um, we have escaped physical thraldom and thus blow must be struck against spiritual slavery. So there's a strong call to, to independence and freedom uh, in these lectures. So my first point, Christianity in the face of atheism and materialism. So as you can see the quote, Reverend Adolphus Howells BA said, one of the vital points that struck him in Professor Cole's lectures was that they were in, very, in every point Christian. He said that he knew that men who made the Department of Science and abstruse subjects a special study are generally off the hinges. And many of them, uh, many of them run even to atheism. But in this case, though the, lectures, um, though the lectures were highly scientific and philosophical, yet they were remarkably permeated with a high Christian tone. And for this, if for nothing else, he had the greatest pleasure in seconding the vote of thank, uh, thanks to the lecturer. So the first theme that I want to present to showcase this new Christianity is the fear of the demise of Christianity. The quote described to Adolphus how to later in his life became assistant to Melville Jones, the, mission, the Bishop of Lagos, mentions atheism as one of the possible dangers to Christianity, especially in this new discursive environment of science, um, which I will discuss more explicit, uh, explicitly in the third theme. So oh, well, I should have mentioned that. So there are three <coughs> themes. Um, and I'll dive into the science bit um, more explicitly in the third theme. Um, but what I want to say here is that the 19th century, of course, was marked by a significant shift to what, um, what we know as science. Of course, medicine had been around much longer, but until the 19th century, medicine was largely determined by um, magnetism or mesmerism, the idea that in a healthy body, magne uh, magnetic fluids existed in equilibrium. And uh, that changed towards the late 19th century. So uh, mesmerism was um, still popular, but mostly among spiritual healers and or theosophists. So medicine in the sense that many of us think of today started to emerge in the late 19th century. Even Newton's theories, um, if you want to look at physics, uh, became restricted to the canon of science only from the 19th century on. And then, of course, we have uh, the discussions around Darwin. Um, so atheism and materialism was one danger. Another very, um, another very present fear of the missionaries was fetishism and heathenism. Um, so, okay. No, it's not. Let me go back. 
Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Uh, I actually wanted to present to you um, a map, a world map, but uh, maybe it has. Oh, okay, so yeah, yeah thank you. So um, in world maps produced around the turn of the century like this one, um, we clearly see it marked as the lands to conquer. So um, the, the greenish uh, vast lands of the landscape, maybe you can guess what that is. Uh, well, it's actually, uh, it's actually heathenism. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a German map, uh, rather, I think it's 1903, 1904. Um, and you see, that is even why the map, what's interesting about the map, the perspective is very peculiar. Usually you'd have Europe in the middle, but this map really draws out the presence of heathenism around the world and how it's sort of central to the missionary cause. Uh, to come from the edges, sort of, uh, into the into the middle. Um, so we can clearly see it marked as the last to conquer uh, the to-do list, as one of my students said. Um, but about you may call himself so fetishism or African religion and science, as he called it, in a very positive light. Like some very industrious correspondence to the Lego standard, he propagated that as far as African practices did not counteract Christian convictions, Christians could still do them. This contextualization was necessary to make the church truly native. In, a, in short, he supported a sanitized version of African religion, practices of which would be transformed into Christian worship or would not disturb it. And I think that was the slide before, yeah. So that's another quote. This is the work of Christianity. Let the missionaries study the system thoroughly and allow the natives to build this religion upon the purified form of their ancestral worship. They will find original texts to hang the true religion on. They will seek and venerate the Lord Jesus Christ as they sought after and venerated Ormila. They will support the Christian ministry as they supported the Babalaos. All native manners and customs not involving any moral principle should not be interfered with. This then will be the true native church. So native Christians um, really interpreted uh, Christianity. It was no longer dependent on the teaching of missionaries, but it was at its core independent of them and could be trans transferred into a new context. But where was it based if not missionary teaching? Um, it was actually based on the true religion. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, this one. Commentators uh, and many preachers have mutilated the Blessed Bible and plain narratives have been twisted, deformed and mystified with false meaning of words just for the purpose of adjusting themselves to the so-called popular and elevated ideas and false conventionalisms of society. Truth yields to no creed. It is circumscribed by no dogma. It is in search of itself. It is in search of God. So um, what we have here is actually um, a pathway into the next uh, theme that I want to present, which is uh, the question of biblical exegesis, eschatology and history. Um, so this is actually from the question and answer session that followed um, uh, the third lecture. And uh, the question was posed, dear Professor Cole, you applied the number 666 in Revelation 13 chapter to Nero. I find in my commentary, that it is also applicable to Latinus, and some say it means Muhammad, and others say the Pope or the Roman Catholic Church, which is correct. Mm -hmm. uh, this question by a native CMS uh, grammar uh, school master um, leads us into the second theme, which thoroughly surprised me, to be honest. Native Christians had been reading Bible commentaries and also knew of the debates on how to interpret certain passages. This I had never thought about. Um, of course, it made sense when I thought more, uh, more closely about it. Uh, the core message of the missionaries had been that the Bible contained everything um, there was to know about God, prayer, worship, salvation, holiness. Um, it was also the first and for a long time only book that was translated into the local language. But when I stumbled across this question and other hints, it slowly dawned on me native Christians had read or at least known of interpretational discussions in biblical studies of their time. And this becomes clearer from the elaborate answer which Abiyomi Paul gives. Um, he first refers to the Jemison Fawcett Brown Bible commentary which makes out Rome, the Catholic Church, 
to be the name of the apocalyptic beast, uh, the number 666. Um, Aber Yumi Kohl, however, dis disagrees with um, uh, the, this uh, Bible commentary and the um, interpretation that they make for two reasons mainly. Um, so he says, it is not only a false interpretation, but it is wicked and uncharitable and a clear evidence of the spirit of intolerance and bigotry. And then um, in, in, the same, in the answer still, the student of both Roman and Jewish history will find how near the beast by nature clearly answers this prophecy, both by name and actions, and by name and actions, sorry. Um, and how Vespasian caused blood to run through the streets of Jerusalem answered very correctly the, the description of the second beast. So his argument rested on the insight that Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, ministers in the Anglican Church and the Free Church of Scotland, were biased against Catholicism. It also employed knowledge of um, Roman and Jewish, uh, Jewish history to make his case. This is interesting because millennialist thought was still very common in missionary circles. Uh, the Jameson, Fawcett, Brown commentary itself shows traces of um, millennialist thought as they end the commentary after Revelation 22 with the with the words, um, "May the blessed Lord, may the blessed Lord, who has caused all scriptures to be written for our learning, bless this humble effort to make scripture expound itself and make it an instrument towards the conversion of sinners and the edification of saints to the glory of His name and the hastening of His kingdom." So missionary work and the expectation of Christ's imminent return often went hand in hand. Uh, premillennialist eschatology peaked in the 19th century. Yet it seems that historical interpretations which read revelation in light of past events rather than in light of contemporary ones were also known to native Christians around 1900. It should really be no surprise as historical criticism of the Bible was on the rise in Europe. This also did not uh, go unnoticed by native Christians. In 1899, just a year before Abba Yumukul's lecture series in Lagos, an anonymous voice in the Lego Standard had called for proliferated historical criticism of the Bible and welcomed the end of our ignorance in this part of the world about subjects like science. Yeah, so uh, yeah, this anonymous voice says, for they are of vital import uh, importance of the, the sciences uh, and upon their issue depends the fate of the world and when dogmatic theology shall have renounced all its claim to science, um, be sure that the wave of scientific conquest will stretch far and wide and Christian agnosticism will be the order of the day. Yet though turning to historical interpretations of the Bible, Abba Yumi Kohl uh, did not share the Christian agnostics um, enthusiasm for the win of science over theology, over religion. Instead he used this historical view of scriptures to support the need for a native church, a new Christianity was, that was firmly part of the existing culture. Uh, so it says, God does not alter existing institutions in order to manifest himself to any people. The Pentateuch uh, is a reproduction in a refined way of Egyptian cosmogenesis adapted to suit a, a peculiar people and to lift them higher than the region of Oz, Osiris, or Ra Amon. This fact does not invalidate revelation. There were baptismal fonts in the pyramids thousands of years before John the Baptist was born, and that uh, multitudes flocked to him on the onset to be baptized is an evidence that the institution was not new. So the Passover agrees with the heathenish, uh, heathenish rites of holding blood, uh, holding blood compa uh, compacts with their gods. So uh, basically historical continuity from Egypt to the Pentateuch, from, e from Egypt to John the Baptist, from heathenism to Passover, um, that was the order of Christianity. Why not embrace it in the form of a new Christianity which benefited from its predecessors but was never held captive by them? So Abayumi Kohl expressed it um, uh, this way, the rule should be adaption, not adoption. And the uh, only judge was the individual's conscience. Um, he, he writes, the conscience is the throne of God and the soul. No priest and no church has a right to interfere with it if its warning is from above. Um, or like an anonymous voice um, uh, stated in 1905, take St. Paul's advice and prove all things and hold fast that which is good. 
So, uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I should have carried you along. So, those are the quotes. Yeah. So, next, next slide. Thank you. So, this is um, leads us into the, into the last theme, uh, third and final um, education, science, and esotericism. So, I do recall himself, um, and uh, this has been shown by a recent article on him, actually. Uh, came out this year by um, a <coughs> PhD student on the history of science, global science, basically. Um, and um, he clearly shows that Abbe Nicole was influenced by the Theosophical Society. Um, so, for example, in a lecture given at the Astrological Society of London, which was founded by a Theosophist, um, he even called himself a Theosophist. Science and religion, especially in its African form, were not opposed to each other, but united in their function as, um, uh, and I quote, handmaids and servants of the indivisible creator. Abayumi Kohl was by far not the only one showing interest in philosophical ideas, and you can see it um, on the left-hand side, um, uh, right, starting from 1900, there were articles about, um, for example, theosophy and African beliefs, uh, then there was a vibrant discussion going on about astrology, um, which uh, and uh, actually um, J. Fashanu, uh, who's, who calls himself as astral scholar, was actually um, somebody who later joined the uh, Theosoph uh, Theosophical Society. On the um, right side, you can see that this is slightly later, uh, 1913, and a different newspaper actually. Uh, the Nigerian Chronicle, uh, which shows that um, uh, theosophical books or books on theosophy, occultism, religion, philosophy, astrology were um, sort of uh, advertised uh, in the newspapers. Um, so he was by Abayumi Kohl, as, as these um, few bits show, was by far not the only one. Um, especially the question whether astrology was a science or not sparked a controversy with one side claiming it um, to be, uh, quote unquote, the most ancient of all the physical sciences, which maintained itself from the earliest known periods as the grandest branch of learning worthy of the closest attention and the assiduity of the wisest and the most eminent men of all ages. And there was also uh, um, another side to this, um, the other side basically seeing it as superstition and fetishism, which is sort of more the cl supposedly classical um, missionary stance. Um, so at the same time, we also have a um, controversy uh, under the headline science uh, and education uh, that demonstrated the, nat the native wish for education to be based more on facts and the study of nature. Um, but uh, so uh, it was a two um, two layered or um, two level um, argument. First of all, uh, the uh, teaching should include more science, uh, as in uh, natural sciences, but it also should follow uh, uh, natural laws and apply Yoruba as the teaching language, because that would have the longest lasting effects uh, on the students. Um, so you have basically a criticism, I would argue, um, of uh, missionary um, uh, missionary schools who were still the order of the day. Um, uh, yeah, uh, demand for more science and education constituted a criticism of missionary educational schemes. I think these interests of native Christians show that science and esotericism, especially theosophy, um, reacted against um, missionary ideas of African religion or tradition. And um, one of the most influential uh, missionary books uh, was uh, until the, the early 20th century and maybe even beyond um, was uh, uh, a book called Fetishism and Fetish Worshippers by the Catholic missionary Reverend Thibaudin. Um, it was actually um, a French original um, uh, published in 1884 and then in 1885 um, published in English, 1886 published in German. So you can see it was really um, read uh, widely. And uh, in his book, um, 
he demonstrated a certain admiration as well as utter rejection of the practices of the so-called slave coast. Admiration, as he claimed, it was a bit more civilized than expected from Africans, and rejected uh, and rejection because to him it was still, uh, and I quote, a complete perversion of religion. He also compared, um, as was fairly widespread uh, practice at the time, African practices with esotericism, uh, especially spiritualism and magnetism. Uh, so he wrote about the so-called Tashris, and you can read that on the on the slides uh, on the top. Um, they believe in spirits and are strengthened in this belief by the practices of magnetism and spiritualism. Uh, thus, to pick up the, uh, the thread laid out by the missionary descriptions like this, Abayu Mikul argued in his lectures that first, divination practices were nothing supernatural and can be accounted for by natural laws, for there is nothing in the universe which is beyond nature. Thus, there was nothing irrational about it uh, to, to Abayu Mikul. And secondly, it was in true accordance with Christianity, um, with religion. So next slide. Um, so he write or is quoted, um, in my opinion, there is no religion higher than the Christian religion as revealed in the Bible. It is the spurious imitation that we decry, not the original. This religion has many things in common with the heathenism and traditions of our country. It appeals to the highest faculty of men. Its standard, uh, its standard of morality, the highest and purest, and it is the most suitable and natural for us as race, if we only understand it and do not confuse it with the inventions of men. So the inventions of men is a very interesting uh, ter ter term here, I think, because um, to peel that supposed shell of, of in inventions of men, uh, the, the sort of ideas, especially missionary ideas about African religion, uh, Abayumi Kohl actually looked towards theosophical ideas. So Ifa became comparable to Kabbalah and thus, uh, and thus now stood in the same continuity with ancient religion and astrology. African societies, uh, African secret societies like the Ogoni became comparable to the Freemasons, the theosophical society themselves, the Rosicrucians, and again, uh, Kabbalah. These comparisons served one aim to make plausible a common origin from ancient science and religion, um, the higher capacities of which should also return to African practitioners. Um, as Abu Nicole said, in it could be discovered the unknown spiritual genius of the race. So <laughs> I have a few concluding thoughts. Uh, I guess this was a wild trip for you, especially if you're not familiar uh, with the source material. Um, so uh, to conclude, or my, my sort of attempt to conclude this, Abayumi Kohl and his peers, members of the early Christian elite in Nigeria, were in search of a new Christianity. Uh, this new Christianity was meant to be different from European Christianity, which was revealed to be just as contextual as what they hoped to create. A new Christianity was needed, as many early Christians, like the Reverend James Johnson argued, to sustain the Christian presence on the African West Coast. So they actually played into missionary um, fears of atheism and materialism taking over. Uh, if Christianity was na not native at, at its core, locals would be touched, but they would just uh, they would also look towards other more contextual options. Um, atheism and materialism were also considered real threats, especially since they made quick headway in Europe. These new scientific debates also affected the native elites on a theological level, as history was more and more considered the most relevant framework for the interpretation of the Bible. This also shifted the frame for the missionary work. The coming of Christ, though still present, became less urgent. The, ad uh, the adaptation to local circumstances, the living in context, became much more pronounced. The Bible, though, continued to be the most important reference point. One can even say that by enforcing the translation of the Bible, Mission, or European missionaries handed over a resource which native Christians could use in a wholly different way uh, than the missionaries had imagined. The scientific debates affected native elites in a third way. They chose to position themselves again um, against uh, scientific materialism. European theologians in the late 19th century overwhelmingly chose to go along with scientific materialism and shifted their focus on the private realm, uh, spiritual, uh, spirituality 
And to an extent, traces of the shift can also be observed in Abayumi Cole's thinking, I think, uh, the emphasis on conscience, on the spiritual realm. However, he also refused to let go of practices that formerly had been seen as the conversion of religion, as you as we've seen uh, in this last point, and as utterly materialist in outlook. He himself, like many other um, early elites, um, dabbled in traditional healing, seeing it as one of, uh, one of the aspects of African religion and science. To him, science and religion could never be separated. Uh, they both served the creator. Thus, he and others adapted theosophical ideas to the local context, comparing African, uh, African secret societies and divination practices um, to theosophical thought. Uh, this he did so that the spiritual capacities of Africans would return to them uh, in, in his own words and, and their own line of development would be a clear path before them. So it is easy to dismiss Abayumi Kohl as a very shining, very extravagant figure. Um, and he surely was, but his thoughts inspired debates at the time. And the simple fact shows that his ideas were very relevant to his context. It is also easy to categorize him and his peers as nationalists. Um, and that is basically what John Keel did um, uh, in, the, in the 1960s. But um, that, uh, and certainly they were nationalists in outlook, but it is, but it is, but is that really all that we can learn about them? Uh, and I think um, uh, they were critical of colonial rule and white missionary domination, but they also had a, held a complex conglomerate of theological convictions. Uh, many of them were inspired by the missionary movement itself, but others also um, uh, that were rather uncomfortable for the um, uh, so some of them uh, were certainly in line with the missionary movement, but others were much more uncomfortable for the missionary movement, actually. Um, esotericism was often rejected by missionaries as a turn towards superstition. Uh, native Christians on the other side were rather open to it, although they were critics, of course, as I've shown, as I've shown you. So what I hope is that this complicates the image um, that we have of Christianity in Africa today as well. The antecedents of um, African initiated churches and Pentecostal megachurches um, were no simple uh, nationalists turning back to the practices of their traditionalist forefathers. Instead, in light of the globally entangled debate on science and religion, they chose to position themselves close to esoteric thought, for example. This means that maybe we have to frame the magical thinking um, implicitly or explicitly attributed to African Christians in, different, in a different way. Abayumi Kohl and others suggest that this magical thinking may actually be the outcome of a grappling with global entanglements rather than its primordial beginning. The magical thinking thus may be actual proof of Africans' full participation in global modernity rather than the proof of their absence within it. So, uh, next slide, please. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.